My name is Jensen Karp, and I'm a professional comedy writer, producer, rapper, and former morning show DJ. But above all else, I'm a sports fan. And I'm going to be honest, I'm extremely worried. Without any signs of competitive athletics worldwide, I feel pretty awful. So it got me wondering, if I feel as bad about it all, then how do the athletes feel? So that's what this podcast is all about. I'm talking to the athletes and sports industry professionals to see what they're up to, how they're holding up. And maybe I can convince one to play me in 2K this weekend. That'd be sweet. Also, what's a weekend? Anyway, this is the No Sports Report. After 16 years in the NFL, tight end Benjamin Watson retired with a single tweet on March 16th in the middle of a global pandemic, somewhat unceremoniously, despite being a fan favorite everywhere he played, from New Orleans to Cleveland to Baltimore to New England, where he won a championship back in 2005. But you see, throughout his career, Benjamin Watson has never really made it about himself. Despite the 547 career catches and 6,058 yards and 44 touchdowns, Most impressive are the two Walter Payton Man of the Year nominations, his Bart Starr Award for Excellence in Leadership on the Field and in the Home, and CNN naming him one of the most extraordinary people of 2014 after a late-night emotional Facebook post about Ferguson and the country's racial divide went viral. But what makes him most heroic? He has seven children, and yes, he's currently in quarantine with all of them a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, an 11-year-old, and twin boys who turn one this month. And I legally have to inform you that they may be the cutest set of twins ever born. How is this man keeping his sanity? Is he okay? Benjamin, tap the phone twice if you need help. Okay, well, let's find out how he's doing and if he thinks his friend Tom Brady will look weird in a Bucks jersey in this discussion with Benjamin Watson on the No Sports Report. Call from Benjamin Watson. To accept, press 1. Press- hey, Benjamin, this is Jensen. Thanks so much for talking to me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Oh, no, please. So first I want to start up. Where are you holed up right now? Like where, where is your quarantine taking place? We're in Boston, Mass. Boston, okay. And how have you been doing? Obviously, I, I needed to speak to you. This was urgent considering you are with your wife and your seven kids. Indeed. <laughs> uh, how... I have I have a nine month old. That's my firstborn, and I I am wondering how you are surviving. We're actually doing pretty well. It, it's a new normal, I think, for a lot of people, but we're fortunate. But the homeschooling part of it, which my wife has done before with the oldest two, but we haven't done it in a couple of years. That's challenging because you know they're still getting information from the school here and there, but just the schedules are all over the place. So we're we're both you know all hands on deck homeschooling uh, the five, and then our youngest two are identical twin boys that are eleven months. So they're kind of the X factor that make things difficult uh, throughout the day when they're awake and we're trying to do school. But you know what? We are healthy and we're doing well. Everybody's fed, clothed and in good spirit. So I can't complain. Well, here's my thing. I don't think the twins need to go to school. They're on their way to be Instagram stars. So I don't think you have to worry about any of their day plans <laughs> as of now. They're adorable. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you what, they're the rock stars of the family and all the older kids love them. And so it's, it's really good to have, you know, the older, the older two being girls, they, they're kind of like little moms. So that's very helpful as well. Has there ever been a time, I mean, I was trying to think of this for you, where all of them, all seven of the kids who range from 11 down to, like you said, turning one, have they all been in the house at one time, Every all nine of you? For an entire day, for yeah. like two, three weeks? Yeah. No. Um, no. <laughs> it, it, you know, with school and the ballet practice yeah. that has been canceled and soccer and all those extracurriculars, this is, this is something totally new. And I tell you, we've been stretched, but... We're, we're handling it. And I think that, you know, parents can be empowered to understand that, you know, you can probably do a little more than you think you can and you want to. And I think this is forcing us all to do that. Sure. I, I still think they should be saluting you in the streets. Uh, but bless your <laughs> wife, Kristen, uh, who put on Instagram about, you know, the difficulties about homeschooling, but loving the time she gets to spend with her kids. So I wanted to ask you, yeah. what, what have you learned about your seven kids during this? Um, you know, I, I think I've learned... I've learned how much, and I kind of knew this, but it's been reinforced how much they really do enjoy being with each other. Now, that doesn't mean that they 
they don't fight because they do. Matter of fact, I was teaching PE today and they were fighting while we were trying to play basketball in the house, which is not a good situation, but hey, you got to do what you got to do. You got it, yeah. Um, at the end of the first uh, last week, we asked them, you know, what, what, how was it being at school at home and what were some things that you enjoyed? What were some things that you didn't? And overwhelmingly, they all said they just like being at home with each other and with us. Yeah. And so, you know, there is this idea that, you know, we got to get them out of the house. We got to get them involved in that. We got to get this kid doing this. It's best for them to never get home and never get home until late at night. We never eat dinner. You know, we, we live in a culture where the more activities, it seems, the better. And the more accomplished we feel as individuals and as a family yeah. when our children are involved in so many different things. But there is a part of them that, at least while they're younger, that needs to be and wants to be with their siblings and with, and with their parents. And so, you know, it's not that they don't miss those things. And, and look, as soon as coronavirus is lifted, ballet is coming back and all those things are coming back. But I think it was really great for us to hear the fact that they really enjoy just being in each other's presence and yeah. in our presence um, in a new way. That's got to be a nice feeling. And and I, I mean, my wife and I, we have a very small household now with the little boy and he doesn't even need toilet paper. So I keep running through my head. Nine people you have to shop for toilet paper, paper towels, groceries. I mean, it is, it has to be a military mindset for you when you enter a Costco. <laughs> well, we were out of town uh, about three weeks ago kind of the last week of travel and then we got back and that's when, when school shut down and everything. And I went to the grocery store and like everybody else, and was able to grab about six rolls, which are about to run out. And people looked at me like I was hoarding. And I told the lady at the, at the cash register that no, look at the picture of my family. I'm not hoarding. Right. I have nine people in my house. So <laughs> this is what we need. Uh, but again, we're eating, nobody's going hungry, where there's a lot of people, that isn't the case. Yeah, true. Now, it's a big deal what you've went through during pandemic with nine people in your house. But beyond that, you made a massive life decision. You at least made it public during the pandemic, which was to retire from your 16 years in the NFL, ending what is an incredible run. Why now? What was the decision that made it happen during these last few weeks? I, I felt like I was totally going to be retired last year. I was done. You know, we were going to move on. And then around this time last year, going into, you know, late April, May, I decided to play again and thought, you know, let me try to give this thing one more shot. And we moved up here to Boston from Louisiana, from New Orleans, right after having twins. Best husband move ever to make your wife move across the country right after having twins. <laughs> yeah, um, you definitely won some points so, there. <laughs> exactly. So, so last year was uh, incredibly tough for us. And then, you know, we go into the season and the season had its ups and downs personally as well as professionally with injuries and those sorts of things. And I think that now we're at a point where we really want to decide where we want to put down some roots. We want to have some stability. Uh, football has provided us an opportunity to do some great things and we've, we've enjoyed it as a family as well as um, it's been something that I dreamed of doing since I was a little kid, like a lot of guys. And, you know, living that dream and, and, and then that dream becomes a reality. Uh, but with that, there are a lot of other um, unintended consequences. There's the moving, there's the, the, the injuries, there's so many other things that go along with it. And now as we talk about, you know, having a family and having young children, children that are growing, you can't get those days back. And so part of the decision was that, you know, 16 years, I'm still able to walk a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I still ha I still have a little bit of my health, although I've gone through a lot and we'll have to maintain that, you know, definitely have to get those sort of things checked up on as time goes on. Sure. But I'm in a good spot as a couple, my wife and I, there are things that we like to do together, ministry wise, philanthropy wise, sure. business wise. There's just a lot of things, a lot of interests that we have. And I just felt like this was a good exit point. It's never perfect, but you know we're happy that we have a chance to make that decision instead of it being forced upon us. Yeah, because I had seen an Instagram post that you posted right before your retirement announcement, which talked about Kobe's death and the coronavirus really reminding you that life can be precious. I mean, do these kind of events play into your decision? Yeah, they definitely do. But also, you know, you, you understand that you have to have a piece about what you're doing. And I do have a piece about being done. Now, now would I play football for another 40 years if I knew I wouldn't be injured and I knew my body could do it and I could compete with the 20 year olds. Of course, I love to play the game. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you see how there comes to be a different season of life and you can influence and affect people and help people and, 
and change people's lives, uh, including the people that are inside your four walls of your house in different ways at different times of your life. And I do feel like this is a different season that's starting for me. So part of that is exciting. It's really it's exciting to see what life is going to be without football because I haven't lived without football in my entire adult life. Right. So I, I'm excited about it. I mean, listen, I'm not trying to put you more in a doghouse with your wife at all here, but I mean, if there was a pushed back, <laughs> if there was a pushed back shortened season coming up next year, would you think about it again? You know, it's funny. <laughs> I joke with my wife. I'll say, hey, no off season. No training camp. <laughs> I'm going to turn 40 in December, but I could do it. You I know, know you could. <laughs> I could do it. I could do 10 weeks. <laughs> and she looked at me like I was crazy. I'm sure. Well, don't tell her. I Don't tell her I brought it up again. <laughs> So no, no, there's not going to be any of that. Um, that is an interesting possibility, though, and, and something that is worth talking about. I mean, just the fact that we don't know what the future is going to hold as far as when we will start football or baseball or basketball again or any of those sorts of things. Um, this is kind of a really fluid situation, and hopefully training can't start on time and this whole thing is gone. But if not, we'll have to adjust from there. I do think there will be a football season. But again, I think listening to the medical professionals and kind of seeing how this thing turns out will determine that. Have you spoken to any other players that show that same concern about the no off season or or anything like that? Is that something that you're hearing from around the league of people being kind of afraid of it starting in September, but missing all that run up to it? No, but we have had conversations about what that will look like. So again, it's all kind of, we're all kind of just predicting the future here. We don't know, but we with the NFLPA as well as the NFL have come together and talked a couple of times about, okay, what does it look like if we start in May? What does it look like if we start later this month? What about if we start in June or July? How will that affect everything? And I think that we just have to be flexible. We have to understand that player safety is always paramount. And if we don't end up starting till later in the summertime, then there has to be some time to make sure that the men are in shape and ready to, to withstand the rigors of professional football. We won't have a scenario where, you know, COVID has shut down everything and guys can't really train, players can't train, and then all of a sudden they have to show up and play football in two weeks. Management, players, fans, it doesn't have to help anybody. So whatever happens, there will be ample time for, for the men to, to get ready. Yeah, and I mean, you, you speak not only as a former player, but as a member of the executive committee for the NFL Players Association, and, and they're eyeing that start, and we obviously have to watch the virus play out, but you have weirdos like Dana White saying he's going to rent out an island and all this insane stuff about you know <laughs> d- WrestleMania still happening. It's like there's a lot of strange pushback as to athletics, and I guess for you, as you're going to be sort of on that committee for the players, it's like what is your main focus about that decision what are you looking at most when you're going to sit down and talk it out with the rest of your peers well it's 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 complex but right now it's the mental health and physical safety of players Mm -hmm. where are they what state of mind are they in um what's their family life like for many of us in this country not just athletes this is one of the first times we've had to spend a lot of time with the people we call family And for a lot of us, that can be tough. You know, we're addressing issues that we've swept under the rug and I had to deal with for a long time. Now, all of a sudden, you got to deal with those things because it's in your house. And so all of us are having to deal with that a bit. And it could be a great thing as well, you know, but navigating that is foremost. And then whenever we do come back, again, it's making sure bonuses are paid that need to be paid, making sure that uh, contracts, and physicals are taken care of because a lot of those things can't be done because people can't be in contact with each other. Yeah. But making sure that although we are working out, many of the guys are working out on their own, it's not the same as going into the training um, facility um, and working out on a daily basis. You know, part of your job uh, being in the NFL Players Association as an executive, like it's not just repping the Julian Edelmans, it's also repping the last guy on the bench who doesn't have the same contract as these superstars. So I'm sure there's a lot of things you're going to have to get into with with their payments and such. Yeah, and, and we have a, a great staff. Look, I mean, you know, but you're right. Um, every member in the membership is important, whether that person sells thousands of jerseys or whether nobody will know their name because. You know, they play for three or four years. Anybody that's on one of those rosters is important and they get the full support of the union. Yeah, totally. It would be impossible to do this interview without a little bit about Tom Brady. Again, I'm not saying that you should play a shortened season in Tampa Bay. Although, <laughs> you know, if, you're, if, if, if that makes you think about it, I'm happy about it. But uh, you know the man well. Do you, did you expect him to leave uh, New England? 
I didn't know, honestly. I did not know what was going to happen. I, like a lot of people, found it hard to believe she would be in another jersey. Mm -hmm. Well, I found it hard to picture. Um, At some point, everybody's going to be gone from whatever team they're on. Change is a part of the NFL, whether it's 20 years later or whether whether it's two years later. It's going to happen to everybody. But it's, it's hard to imagine somebody of that magnitude not being where he's been for the last 20 years. That being said, man, I'm happy for him. Yeah. I really am. I'm excited for him. Uh, this year for me, being back in New England, I got to spend more time with, th- with him this year than I did in my last stint altogether, just because I think we were both the old guys in the locker room yeah. and we had kids and we were married for a while. So, we, you know, we, we kind of talked on a different level than a lot of other people. And, and so I didn't know what he was going to do. I knew his contract was up and we talked about it, but I didn't know what he was going to do, where he was going to go until until that day like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, seeing him, I've seen people make photoshops with him in the New Jersey, and it, it does remind me of Shaq in that Phoenix Suns jersey at the end of his career. I'm just like, what is that look? But you know, it, it just goes to show that athletes like anybody else in any other profession, they've got to live their own lives. Yeah. And they have to do what's best for them and their family. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times as fans, and I say as fans because I am a fan of Tom, we, we want to hold them in wherever we see them. And for all of us, whether we're working a job, you know, as a journalist or whether, you know, we're a teacher, whatever it may be, there may be some time in your life where you need some change. Yeah. No, for totally. you. Yeah. For no, you. I agree with you. And, and even if other people don't see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, some people don't see it that way, but, but I think, I think over time people will, and people do. And sometimes people see it that way when all of a sudden it happens to them and then they realize, oh, okay. You know, I, I get it now. More with Benjamin after this quick break. As you know, communities are experiencing these difficult times differently across the country. School closures, job disruptions, lack of paid sick leave, and the coronavirus disproportionate impact on adults age 60 and older and low-income families are all contributing to the demands placed on food banks across the country. So Feeding America, alongside their network of 200 local food banks, are actively coordinating with lawmakers, federal, state, and local agencies to tailor responses on a county-by-county basis, depending on what is most urgently needed to ensure our most vulnerable populations continue to have access to food and other needed resources during this emergency. Right now, their greatest need is donations and support of local food banks. Please visit feedingamerica.org to learn more about their response efforts and how you can help. Now, here's the rest of my chat with Benjamin Watson. You are a multiple-time Walter Payton Man of the Year finalist. You won the Bart Starr Humanitarian Award. Like you mentioned a little earlier, philanthropy and charity and your ministry is a big part of your career. I have said before, and I talk with my family about it a lot, that this feels so big, right? So like when Katrina happened, you knew where to send money, right? You know where to send money uh, if you're looking to help refugees. You know certain things. I know charity names. I know where to go. This feels so big, and it feels... Like, even the restaurant down the street from you is in so much peril, just like those who are losing family members. It it, it really is kind of a great equalizer for a lot of people's pain. And I guess asking you, as someone who has made charity such a large part of your life, what do you see as the best and easiest way to help right now for this epidemic? That is a great question. I feel that same frustration because it seems that we are combating something that is totally unique. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't really identify it. This is totally different than fighting for some sort of injustice where we correct this law, that law, things will get better. You know, people want to do something and you've seen a lot of people do something, but then you wonder, man, is that, is that enough? So the, the very, the very first thing, you know, we do this with our kids every day is we, we pray. Right. We pray. We, we we pray for those who are sick that we know. We know a few people personally that are sick. We pray for their healing. Uh, we pray for our leadership, the president, whether you voted for him or not. He's the leader, the elected leader of the country. He has to make decisions along with people in his circles. We need them to be decisions that will be for our better, not for um, our detriment. And, and then, you know, for those who are on the front lines, meaning medical people, people who are serving food, The list goes on and on and on. So that's something I always encourage people to do. Secondly, it's national, but it's also local. 
who in your sphere of influence in your local community is is helping? Um, we have a friend who owns a restaurant in Boston, yeah. and um, he is delivering meals to people who don't have them, even kids who get free lunch that aren't able to get their lunches. And so how can we support him? Maybe purchasing meals, yeah. you know, helping him in that way. I, along with some other people, set up helping churches initiatives where there are a lot of small churches around the country who aren't going to survive this, especially because people can't meet and worship on Sundays. And yeah. so encouraging larger church- churches to donate to this fund to give grants that will really help with people being laid off or rent. Things like that, things that are very, very practical yeah. um, ways to get involved. Yeah, it's not just abroad. It might be just right down the street from you. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily line up, it would appear politically, uh, me and you. We come from different backgrounds and different uh, religions and such. I, I guess I was so impressed with your social media response to a lot of these things because you do say, listen, he's our leader. That's what we have to do. But you also encourage people to question what they're hearing, to get as many sources as possible as they can because so much of the information feels like we're getting it through filters. How hard have you found it maybe with your children or with your family to to find the truth in these things? I think listening to a lot of different perspectives. I am kind of a, not really a news junkie, but I do like listening and watching the news. Um, Within that, I'll watch different polar opposite news channels Mm -hmm. and see how they talk about the same thing in an entirely different way. (laughs) And and try to gather from those channels as well as others, as well as things that are the stuff that's, that's written um, that I come across online to try to get kind of a full picture of the spin and the, and the bias that, that's in a lot of reporting. Yeah. And so with the kids, with something like this, been other current events that we've talked about, whether it was police brutality on TV yep. and talking about that sort of thing, or you name it, something that's happened that's kind of a light and rod issue that happens in our, in our culture that's all over the news. And just try to see the humanity in it, number one. And whether we agree with somebody or not, understanding that that person is, is a person and they deserve respect just because they're human, even if we don't agree with them. But then just trying to get a full picture of what's going on. And honestly, I think the biggest part of it is sometimes you come across facts later that disprove your own ideas and being willing to admit that. I'm not right about everything. Yeah. Uh, everything I read isn't 100% right. But being able to be honest about that and, and, and say, you know, I thought this way and now I'm starting to find out that, you know, that wasn't really true. I think having that sort of, of humility is important because the, the fact of the matter is none of us really, really knows everything. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just to show some humanity in that, I think you're 100% right. Uh, you've been outspoken over the years about your Christian faith. I wanted to ask you what role religion has played in your quarantine. I mean, I have been sort of uh, surprised to see services still going on uh, amongst this. I know not everyone is supportive of it, and and I know that there's been a great sort of YouTube videos and live feeds that you can get into. I know that you worked with a service uh, called Huddle Up. I wanted to know what that was, but also just kind of what your thoughts are in churches during this pandemic. I think that it obviously look, looks a little bit different uh, for everybody. For us, we, we haven't left the house in three, <laughs> three weeks. My wife looks at me crazy when I want to. Yeah. Um, fortunately for us and for a lot of other people, there's service online that you can watch. But, but really, the way it works in our home is a lot of what we do is led by us. It's led by mommy and daddy. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's devotions in the morning, reading some scripture, talking about it, and we do that regardless, whether you know there's no virus or whether there is a virus. Parents in the home, the home is where the majority of our um, faith is carried out. And, and, the, and the majority of where we teach our children about the Word of God is in the home. Yeah. Sunday is great, but one day a week it, it, it isn't going to do it. And that's also not the pastor's job is not to raise your kids. That's your job. Sure. So yeah. um, the huddle up thing you're referring to is about Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And Fellowship of Christian Athletes is a, is a sports organization that goes from high school all the way up into um, college and, and also some professional athletes. And the idea there is doing a virtual program where I've hosted it a couple of times where I interview different athletes about their faith, but also just about how they're doing during this time. It's really just about connecting with people in a time where we can't be physically near one another, but feel um, encouraged 
no matter where they are. Yeah, well, I have a few seconds left with you. I just wanted to ask if there's anything we've adapted in this new time that you think people will keep, something that, in your opinion, should live on forever. Um, my hope is that for, for those families, and I include myself in this because we can get really, really busy. Eating dinner as a family is one of the most important things a family can do, period. Yeah. Period. And it, it doesn't always happen, and it can't always happen because of, you know, high school football practice or ballet, as I mentioned before. But I hope that that, that will be something that as we get back to a sense of normalcy, that people will miss if they don't do it. Right. And I hope that some of these good habits that we're being forced into will continue. And if we remember, we try to make those things a priority. And again, like I said, I'm talking to myself when I say this. Yeah. Well, 2020 it might be the first time a lot of these people had that kind of dinner. Yeah. Lastly, everyone I talk to, every athlete gets some suggestions from me. I feel like I'm a good person to lead the way. In truth, I'm not. But let's pretend I am. I have suggestions for you to take on during the quarantine. I'm going to give them to you even if you don't want to hear them. First, make your own bread. This seems to be very trendy online. People are going out of their way to learn how to make bread. I don't know if it's because they couldn't find it at their local market, but I saw someone today make a pretty good sourdough. We do that. We do make our own bread. So that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Oh, great. So moving on. This one, maybe not as much. Write a new sitcom, okay? So you've written books before. Uh, I feel like writing a sitcom about the pandemic with seven kids in your house at all times. This is a hit on a CBS network level. <laughs> maybe you can write it for us. <laughs> there you go. I would not be against it. I mean, my ending would have, the, the pilot would end with me having a nervous breakdown, but absolutely. <laughs> and then lastly, I don't know if this ties into the sitcom, but I was thinking maybe Benjamin could buy a van and then you would paint on the side of it, and you guys would be a uh, like a Partridge Family traveling band, the Watsons and Daughters. Uh, and you guys go around the nation, and you you sort of sing us out of the pandemic, all very uplifting songs about now we're allowed to go back outside. Hey, my kids would love that. Honestly. There you go. They love to sing. Now, sometimes it sounds great, sometimes it doesn't, but they love to sing. <laughs> well, I think it's a better idea than going on TikTok, which it seems everyone's <laughs> doing during the pandemic. So I'll, I'll, I'll help you pick a van. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, Benjamin, thank you so much for uh, for joining me. And again, uh, much love to your family. Stay healthy, stay safe. And again, you guys are, you're like war veterans to me. Seven kids, taking care of them, homeschooling. It is, it's truly a remarkable feat. Well, I appreciate the encouragement. You be well, be safe, and um, hope to talk to you soon. Take care. The No Sports Report is produced and distributed by Tree Fort Media. The show is executive produced by Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and me, Jensen Karp. Our series producer is Matthew Kugler. Tom Monahan is our senior audio engineer and sound supervisor with additional production help from Tim Schauer, June Rosen, and Haley Mandelberg. With production and editing by Jasper Leek. Our theme music is composed by Spilkus. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe, rate us, and review us on Apple Podcasts. You have nothing else to do. Send it to your friends, tweet, share, post about it, do whatever you can. And please visit feedingamerica.org. And if you're able to make a donation, any amount will help make a difference. And you can learn more about other ways to help on their website. For more information on the No Sports Report, links to the socials, and for our show transcripts for the hearing impaired listeners, please go to treefort.fm. Be safe and be well.